Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Gay Men Going Deeper. We're back today and we have the usual foursome. So Matt, Callan, and Reno. You said foursome. I did. <laughs> today we are talking about how we cope with challenging emotions. And this may not be as sexy as things like sex and grinder and uh, all the wonderful topics we've been talking about recently, but I think this is a very important topic because emotions is what drives everything we do. So to start off today's conversation, I'm gonna pass it off to Matt. Okay. <clears throat> hmm. I'm practicing something new where I'm not, I'm not planning. I'm just speaking from the moment. So <sighs> well, ever since I was a little boy, I've been a highly, highly sensitive person <laughs> and I've felt my feelings extremely deep and I felt other people's feelings extremely deep. So this is a very, um, this is a very intimate topic for me just because um, learning how to cope with my emotions has been pretty much um, something I've been struggling with my whole life. Um, learning how to differentiate what's mine and what's other people's as an empath. And then, you know, learning that I, I learned the term empath at the age of about 25. I didn't really know much about what it was. So I kind of went from, you know, birth all the way to 25, kind of not knowing why I felt so deeply, why I was so sensitive, why I was intuitive. And um, so my journey has really been about moving from my head into my body. That's been my experience. And um, the more time that I spend in my body, the less time I spend in the intensity of my emotions and I access states. And I think the difference between states and emotions is one is always there for you, like love, joy, enthusiasm, it's there for you to access. Whereas emotions are stimulated by um, the activity in your mind, right? The mind is, is active and it's creating a response in the body. And I think that's the difference. So as I've learned how to journey from my head into my, my body, I've been able to access these states a lot more easily and be more, more consistent, but it's not always the case, right? So I would say right now in my life, I'm probably spending about 50% of my time in my head. And when I'm in my head, I can either be in positive experience or I can be in negative experience, right? And um, for, for the purpose of today's talk, I'll talk a bit about like, my negative experience in my mind and kind of what I do with it when it amps up. And um, so I just recently moved from, from Calgary to Vancouver and I had a bit of an incident where I arrived at the destination where I was supposed to live and it didn't work out. <laughs> and I had just spent about 14 hours driving and uh, I arrived at about 7.30 at night and to realize that this living situation wasn't a good fit for me. And I basically was just like in this highly emotional state of like, okay, what do I do? Um, panicking. <laughs> so I contacted my best friend and we were just kind of hashing it out. Like, what should I do? And I was just, I was so tired, you know, that I couldn't even think of a solution because I was so exhausted from driving. And um, I think one of the best skill sets that I've learned to develop in this, in this, this life, I guess, when it comes to emotions is just surrendering to what the moment is trying to offer me. And I think oftentimes when I'm in negative emotions, it means that they're, the current is trying to carry me in this direction and I'm trying to swim against the current. And I've learned to just turn around and start swimming with the current and I will eventually get to where I want to be. Um, but sometimes it doesn't feel like I'm getting to where I want to be because of where I want to be is different versus want and need, right? I want to be here. I want to be this person. I want to experience life from these emotional states, but yet life is trying to show me and grow me in certain ways that I need. And, I, and that's the distinction. I want over here, I need over here. And I swim up current when I'm moving towards what I want versus allowing the life 
to kind of take me to what I need to, to be doing. And um, <clears throat> so I had about 30 minutes of panic in this incident. And then I, I, I was basically homeless for four days, but I didn't, it didn't even phase me. I, I was staying in a hotel, like it was fine, but like my upbringing, my upbringing kind of showed me that um, stability is, is so important without stability. There's a reason to become anxious. My parents split when I was eight and I moved back and forth between houses. Right. So the, the, the sense of stability for me, it's so tied into safety. And, and so I allowed myself to just feel that feeling of being unsafe. I didn't try and push it away. I, I allowed it. And that allowance alone was enough to give me permission to feel that. And the resistance of feeling that was just, it just dispelled. So I would probably say just to kind of sum up my little, my little talk here, I would probably say one of the, the, the two, the two biggest things is going to be surrender and allowance, but they're really one in the same, right? When we allow our feelings to be, we're surrendering to the feeling being there. And then the feeling moves on. It's, it's energy, right? And it, it, we give it permission to move on when we, when we allow it to be there. So um, I'm, and, and this is, this is a practice. This is a, this is a, a, a very fine art that I'm learning on how to allow myself to experience um, the undesirable feelings that I don't want to experience. So um, yeah, I'll leave it, I'll leave it there for now. Thanks, Matt. I, um, <clears throat> I completely agree with all that. And it has certainly been I think a challenge for a lot of people to have to learn to allow those challenging or negative emotions to be there. It's we're, we're wired to want to avoid them, right? Yeah. And that's okay. That's just how we are wired as humans and that's fine. And so it takes a lot of effort, <clears throat> I think, for us to allow them. But at the end of the day, something that someone told me once was that emotions don't actually, can't really hurt you. Well, we, we think what'll happen actually causes us more anxiety than the emotion itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of things I want to jump in here with because I can resonate with what Matt was talking about because in my past, I, um, I don't think I've really ever told anybody this, but like there was a short period of my time when I thought I was going to be homeless and it was very close. Um, and it was when I had first moved to Toronto um, back in 2000, early, early 2014. And I had just done like a six month, uh, like volunteer trip around the U S and I was like settling in Toronto. I was going to get an adult job and grow up and that wasn't going so well. And I had to be on like assistance in order to survive. And I literally had like maybe like a hundred or $200 in my bank and I had rent coming up and like, I had no job and I had like no idea how I was going to get anything. And like I had done interviews for jobs and everything. And I was waiting on this one job in particular. And I was just freaking out the whole time because I was like, I'm essentially like, I'm going to be homeless. But like a lot of my life has been turbulent like that. I also come from a divorced family and I was used to instability. So I was kind of like, this is just how life is. Um, but when I really just like allowed myself to face those fears and to go through the to go through the pain and like fear of like the reality of like what could actually happen. I just kind of like surrendered to it and thank God my roommate wasn't home <laughs> because like I literally ended up like crying on my bedroom floor. Like I'm not talking crying. I'm talking like sobbing and weeping and like freaking out on my bedroom floor for probably a solid hour or two. And then I just laid there for like four more hours, just in complete and utter surrender, just like being like, what the fuck do you want from me universe? Like, what direction are you pushing me in? What, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? Send me a signal. Tell me like, I am at my wits end here. And like, I just had to give into those feelings and surrender into that energy and just like, almost allow myself to live it to just be like, what is the worst case scenario? I am living on the street. Like what, like what is the worst place I can take myself right now mentally and just let myself live there and be okay with it. And then I walked myself backwards from there going, okay, but am I still alive? Yes. Okay. What's the next step? Like, would that actually ever happen to me? Well, no, I could always like, not that I could go home per se, because my mom lives in a one bedroom apartment and I don't talk to my dad, but it was like, 
people in my life would never let me be homeless. Like that would never be a thing. And then I was like, okay, well, what would be the next step from there? And I kind of built myself back up. And it was almost as if I had already lived in that reality that I was like, okay, well, I've lived through it now, mentally speaking. Now I don't need to worry about if it happens because it's already happened in my head. So then I almost was ready to take on everything because I was like, cool, well, I've been there, I've done that. Now I don't need to necessarily experience it. And the next day I shit you not I got what they call the golden call from my employer that I moved to the Middle East for five years I traveled all over the world and it was literally the next day after that and I had been waiting for like six weeks for this phone call <laughs> and it's so crazy that when you release and you genuinely just like surrender and just you go what do you need me to do like I think of it as if the universe is the water and I am the tap. And I'm just like, I just need to turn it on and just let it flow. And so when you back off and you surrender and you put yourself in that energy of like, okay, I've had the freak out. Now let's just surrender and let's see what happens. Like mountains will move. Um, and then the second part of that is I actually ended up doing what I call, um, I call it the fear challenge on Facebook. And I did it maybe like six months ago or eight months ago. And um, I learned about something called somatic experiencing. This is like obviously recently. So it was much after the, my experience I went through, but somatic experiencing where um, it kind of equates the, the short notes version is it's like when animals go through fear and like a, tr a traumatic experience, how do they react to it? And why do they not develop the chronic pains and illnesses and things that humans develop? And so there's studies between that and somatic experiences experiencing is kind of the thing on the other side where Dr. Peter Levine developed it, where it's like humans need to relearn how to be in our body and how to experience fear and how to experience pain and how to experience those emotions and not trap them and push them down because that's what creates pain and that's what creates chronic illness and, and stuck energy in our body. So I did this fear challenge kind of doing a little tidbit of teaching people how to get into their body. Um, and the way I did that is I watched like a YouTube video for like 10 minutes of people like dangling off the sides of buildings, because I knew that that would put me in like an anxiety ridden, like fear response. And I challenged myself to do that for like two weeks straight. And on one side, people are like, oh, that's just desensitizing yourself to it. I'm like, yes. But on the other side of that, I'm forcing myself to feel and go through those emotions because you can't go over fear. You can't go around it. You can't pretend it's not there. You have to experience it and let it go through your body and release whatever energy is in there. I didn't know what I needed to process, but my body needed to go through that. And now it doesn't affect me the same way it used to affect me. And so what feelings, being emotional and vulnerable and experiencing those kinds of things are so important, especially in today's world, because if you don't do it, that's not doing that is more detrimental to your health than you would think. And it's like, better you've just released all that energy and it's kind of the same thing when we go through our emotions we need to just fucking get it out and cry it out and feel it and then it's like okay cool poof it's done now i can like move on to the next thing sorry that was a lot <laughs> no you know i it's amazing i felt so connected to you when you were speaking like the whole time i feel like i, saw I almost you. cried there girls not gonna lie <laughs> what's that you almost have, cried you said when i was talking about that first bit mm -hmm. yeah yeah i felt you i feel like i learned some things about you too so that was beautiful thank you for sharing yeah yeah um the i don't know how long ago it was um maybe about a month or so ago, maybe a bit more, I watched this video on racial prejudice by um, Byron Katie. And 
there's this black woman who she uh, is facilitating with and they go through this process called the work and um, you know, long story short, this, this black woman has a breakthrough around her own prejudice and she hysterically cries and it's this incredibly cathartic experience for her. And I did not expect this, but <clears throat> when I saw that, um, right around the time she had her cry, um, I started crying. And it continued. Uh, I cried in the bed. I cried into the pillow. I cried on the floor. Um, I, I went downstairs into the basement because it continued and it got progressively louder. And um, it, it blew me away because I've never cried that intensely and I've never cried that intensely for that long either. Um, it was probably about an hour. And it was such a fascinating experience to me because I'm not even fully sure what was untapped. But, you know, as you spoke about earlier, Callan, it was like this deep, deep relief. Like, yes, I felt tired in a way, like not even tired, but there was sort of this fatigue. It's almost like, um, you know, dare I sort of compare, but like when you've had this incredible fuck or or you know evening of love making and like you're just spent but you feel oh amazing right um it was like that and um and so what 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 was what was interesting to me is to to kind of notice like oh all of that was there like i had no idea that all of that was there and still to this point i'm not even really sure what happened I just know something shifted. And, and even the way that I engaged around conversations related to prejudice um, or discrimination or race or what have you, um, I, I became a lot more responsive and compassionate and empathetic and understanding on the other side of that. Um, so Emotion is information. And, um, and so, you know, we have different words and different meanings for different um, embodiments and expressions of that emotion, be it sadness, anger, um, uh, joy, um, disgust. Uh, those are some of the core emotions. And the way that I look at them these days is they're, they're sort of, pointing at something or drawing my attention to an experience that I'm having. Sometimes I recognize that I'm experiencing emotion as a result of my thinking. So I'm living in the feeling of my thought or my thinking. Um, and other times I don't fully understand what is happening or what's occurring. It might be um, feelings informing me of something that's happening um, even externally, right? So you know, someone's doing something and I'm noticing it and then I'm having an emotional experience as a result of that. Um, but something that was said earlier really stood out to me. Um, and I think it was maybe Michael who was talking about it, but um, my experience has been, and I saw it, I, I, I suppose I won't name any names, but someone close to me who has two children remember uh, one of her children was at my home and she was playing with some toys and she became emotional and she started to cry. And this, this person who, who I'm close to had you know, said, um, stop that crying. We don't cry at other people's houses. And I see this sort of thing happen all the time and just in general across the board. I see um, this sort of parenting happen in all sorts of different um, families and familial dynamics. And I've always kind of noticed that there's 
or or felt rather that there was something off about that. That's like, hmm, there's there's something off about this. This you know this this language of well, if you don't stop crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about, or or like stop crying. We don't you know we don't cry here or what have you, right? And what I started to realize is like we were taught that to feel is shameful and to express our feelings is shameful. And so repeatedly, 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 right? Um, those feelings are shut down. It's not safe to feel, it's not okay to feel, um, you know, to feel is weak, to feel is wrong. Uh, and me being a very sensitive child at an early age, very aware, you know, as Matt said, um, you know, like I, I was also very sensitive, very, very empathic, um, very empathetic. And um, I, I picked up on everything that was happening in my environment always. Um, it was said to me repeatedly that I, you know, that I knew too much for my own good or I was too aware for my own good. And, um, you know, one of the things that I, remember is um uh, th this is kind of edgy to say out loud I guess but I just want to acknowledge that we do our best and we're often um you know engaging based on what we know and our sort of level of consciousness and awareness so you know my dad used to reprimand um me for my sensitivity for my expression and um I think gradually over time between him and my mom and the boys at school and teachers, uh, I learned to become really cold and calculating and, um, and to really sort of, uh, I don't want to say manage my emotions because it's not quite that, but manipulate them, manipulate them is the word. And what developed over a period of time was an emotional volatility. One of my favorite quotes, um, I mentioned it on one of our previous podcasts, if you bring forth what is within you, what is within you will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what is within you will destroy you. And what I noticed is that I was not bringing forth what was within me because um, it was not okay, it was not safe. I felt shame around it. And so I became this emotionally volatile person, manipulative, controlling, um, you know, uh, um, um, passive aggressive, sometimes directly aggressive, um, catty, um, and 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 there was a lot of projection. And um, it really wasn't until probably about nineteen that my healing journey really kicked off, and that was because I decided to come out and you know announce to my world and the world that I'm gay and the floodgates opened and I suddenly became this person who could freely express and 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 disclose his his experience and you know and his sort of authentic essence and being and that just continued over over you know a period of time and so one of the things that you know, I, I encourage always, whether it's in um, my friends or my family or, um, you know, especially the little ones, is, is self-expression, self-exposure, and, and self-disclosure, you know. And when I speak of self-exposure, um, I'm reminded of what you were saying earlier, Cal, uh, it, it brought this idea up for me of, you know, exposing ourselves to the things that and the experiences that inspire emotion and emotional expression. Um, there's real value in that. There's catharsis in that. There's um, healing in that. There's aligning in that, right? And um, yeah, I, I feel like, you know, this sort of emotional intelligence and, and this, this well-being that we're all sort of pining for, they like, they go hand in hand. And so I'm, I'm always um, aware of when I'm repressing my own emotions and also 
when I recognize that others may be doing the same and I actively um, encourage that expression and, and invite people to feel. I, I notice too with my, my nieces and nephews, like one of the things that I'll do when I notice them throwing a fit is um, I'll just kind of talk to them very calmly. Like I'll just, I'll speak to them. I'll, I'll sort of meet them at their, you know, where they're at. I'll, I'll level with them. And in a very calm way, like recognize and acknowledge that they're sort of having the experience that they're having and that I'm, I'm standing by and I'm here and, you know, do your thing, let her rip, um, you know, and then once, you know, perhaps once you're done, like we can sort of talk about, you know, what's going on and, and, and maybe move forward in some capacity. But yeah, I think it's so important and um, it, it's only, really clicking for me now like wow that's right like from such an early age we are shamed and reprimanded for feeling and it's no wonder we're all walking around um not only continuing this pattern within ourselves replaying it even even as it's maybe stopped but um, uh, externally at least um, but then we're, we're sort of projecting it onto other people right and not and not making it okay or safe for for the people around us to feel and um, and I, I've gone on a tangent here but I guess the last thing I would say is in this journey toward <laughs> like enlightenment and, and being this like woke and spiritual person, I think somewhere along the way, it stopped being okay again to feel. It was like, oh, okay, did the work. And then all of a sudden, you know, cue this whole spirituality enlightenment thing. And suddenly it's like, oh, it's not, it's not woke to feel, it's not. It's not enlightened to feel, you know? And I had, my brother actually said that to me today. He said, for someone who's, you know, for someone who, who's, you know, so enlightened or, or so interested in enlightenment, like you seem to get really worked up sometimes. And I was like, that is not the purpose of this journey. You know, that is not the purpose of spirituality. You know, it's not, it's not so that we have some way to bypass our emotions. You know, spirituality is the recognition of our connection to everything, you know, um, and everything is spiritual, including emotional expression. Um, and I believe that it is through our, um, you know, our, our connection to our emotions that we, um, you know, that we are able to truly embody a sort of spirituality, right, deeply and, and, and truly. So, yeah. Um, and like, I'm still figuring it out. I'm still figuring it out. I mean, sometimes I'm feeling things and I'll pick up my phone and scroll or I'll walk to the corner store and buy a bag of salt and vinegar Lay's and, you know, a couple of Reese's Pieces peanut butter cups, um, you know, or call a friend um, because I'm just like, whoa, this is overwhelming or watch a video on YouTube um, so I don't have to feel what I'm feeling. But more and more I'm learning to sit with it, um, to sit with it, to breathe into it and to recognize that emotion is information and that my feelings are messengers. And, and, you know, and, and that to feel is to heal and to feel is to be alive, you know? <laughs> yeah. When you stop feeling, you're dead. Like, so, you know, keep on feeling. While you while you're here, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna step off my soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I could go on and on and on though. I like emotions, emotional. This topic is like, it hits home for me because I just. I she just took so, us on a journey. Honestly, though, I felt so repressed when I was younger, and so I'm just like about it. I'm like everybody, just fucking feel like same seas. Do it. Do I it. locked myself down as a kid when my parents divorced. That's it. Emotions turned off. Like yeah. from that point on, I was like 
six, maybe five, six, seven, turned right off. I didn't cry. I wasn't like anything crazy. And then it wasn't until I got kicked out at 16 that it was just like, I was hugging my best friend, leaving her house. And all of a sudden it was just like an explosion. And it was just like, what, what, what's happening? This is too many emotions. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's important to remember that we don't turn off just one emotion. When we learn the skill of numbing them or avoiding them or um, resisting them, we learn how to do that with all of our emotions, including the ones that we want, like joy, love, laughter, all that good stuff. And I see that a lot, I'm sure we all do, in, in the gay community, especially because with things like shame, which is clearly one that does not feel good, we have all these tools and techniques that we learn to resist it or avoid it, numb it. And then people will tell me, oh, I feel so apathetic about life. And it's because they've turned off that ability to feel in general, right? So when turning off the, the, the pain, you're turning off all of the other ones too. And then it becomes a, yeah, a very apathetic life. That's not, you know, Reno said it so well that, that it's, it makes us human. Feeling is something that we uniquely experience um, and on the wider range of emotions that we get to enjoy on this, in this sort of lifetime is part of the fun ride of it. Now they don't always feel good, of course not, but without anger, we wouldn't know joy or without fear, we wouldn't know love and so on and so forth. So it's that uh, yin and yang, right? Like you can't have one without the other, you can't have light without the dark and so on. So that's something I try to remind myself of when I'm going through my own um, negative emotion. Um, question for you guys, for anyone out there, for the listener or viewer who is in the middle of experiencing some kind of negative emotion. So this is what clients will tell me. They'll say, okay, this is all easy when I'm talking to you one-on-one -on -one during a session, but what happens when I'm out there in the world and it comes up for me? So let's ask that question. Um, what do you guys think is a good practice in the moment when negative emotion shows up for you when you're not working one-on-one -on -one with your coach or somewhere where it's safe? I, I mean, I, go off. First of all, I'm just going to say like, <sighs> go off. Um, and I know that's probably like unexpected, but so the other day, my mom and I got into it and like, I don't curse often, but, but I, but I cursed. I said a swear word. I said the F word. Um, and, you know, after the fact, I was like, damn I did that okay um and on the other side of that I recognize like oh <laughs> there's a there's a button there there's a there's a tender spot there so, something was triggered and so I don't look at that situation and go oh no I done messed up um or like that was that was wrong what happened was wrong right no what if if i'm able to walk away from that experience and my awareness has been expanded and maybe next time i choose differently in that moment then like then i've learned something right and the the other thing i would say is sometimes it's helpful to just like walk away like just walk away i was like, just gonna say that right like walk away take a time out have a breather like lose your shit in another room if you need to let her rip and then come back when you're collected and 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 navigate the situation now my 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 thought is people are going to hear that and go because there's that egoic like piss part of ourselves that's like well I don't want to walk away like I want to tell them what's up because they just like struck a nerve or a chord so like why would I walk away and go cool off I want them to know how I felt and I want them to feel how I feel right now because they pushed all the wrong buttons and it's like what I get um or what I would say to to that idea is you're not absolving them of accountability and responsibility by walking away and taking a breather and you know and taking a moment to collect yourself you can come back and still have a conversation and say hey what just happened there 
I'm not cool with it. You know, that didn't feel good. I felt angry. You know, when you did this or said that, I felt angry. You know, I felt sad. Um, Because oftentimes that's another thing. On the other side of anger is actually sadness. If you dig a little bit deeper sometimes, you're like, oh, I wasn't actually angry. I was sad. And actually I was hurt. I felt hurt, you know. Um, And you can come back and have a conversation about it. And you're probably going to accomplish way more um, in that sort of a conversation than flying off the handle at someone. Like you will get your point across and probably get everything you are, 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 are wanting from that interaction and within that interaction. Um, and then some, if you go cool off, come back and have a conversation. Yeah. So. That's my I was going to say, I'm a walk away person. Like I don't yeah. do the blow up ever. Like I never do that. I'm always 100% the walk away person because I prefer to take the time with myself and my thoughts and like sort through everything instead of like saying something that I am, I know how to make this other person hurt. So I'm going to throw something at them purposefully to make them hurt because they hurt me. I'm like, that's not going to help anybody. That's just going to perpetuate the negativity, the fear, the anger, the hurt. And the only way I can stop that cycle is if I remove myself because this other person is clearly not removing themselves. I remove myself from the situation. I go sit on it. I think about it. Everybody cools off. Then I come back and I discuss it. And I always present it in a way that this is how I felt. This is the experience I had because the other person can't argue with my feelings and my experience because they are mine. They're individual to me. Um, But in saying all this, there's no right or wrong way to deal with any situation because we each have our own journeys. We each have our own lives. We each have our own things that we have to go through. So whatever you need to experience in the moment is something you need to experience. I have had one situation where I did explode and it did not feel good. And it's because the other person on the reciprocal end would not let me leave. Like I've never had it before where the other person literally followed me and would like cornered me in a room and would not let me escape it. And I was like, like I, I removed myself, like you don't have the right to keep pushing me in, like literally pushed me into a corner. And now you're forcing me to like scream and yell at you. And I'm like, this other person was, you know, perpetuating their own ends because like, they're like, this always happens, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, because you're pushing it. Like you're forcing this negative situation to happen. And they kept saying over and over again, like, like this is how people love each other like you only like love each other if you yell and scream at each other and like all this kind of like bullshit that i was just like okay so you obviously learned a trait growing up you learned a way to deal with stuff and you think in your head in your experience that like you only truly love somebody if you can be aggressive with them and angry with them and scream and shout and yell at them and i did and didn't have that experience growing up. But as I grew up, I realized I didn't want to have that experience. And I was like, no, that is absolutely not how you show love. Like I'm showing you more love by walking away because I'm not going to push you and purposely hurt you in order to get whatever point across. I'm going to go away, think about it so that when we come together, yes, my feelings and thoughts will be heard, but it's not in a way that I'm trying to hurt you or make you feel bad. It's just so that everything's on the table. and. It was so mind blowing and it just reinforced in me that it's like, no, I never want to have this experience. Like I enjoy my experiences of like, I don't enjoy them, but like, I like to take myself out of the situation and then come back to the, and like have a conversation. And sometimes even by then both parties are like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Like I was in the emotion. I was in the moment, whatever. And like, it completely resolves itself simply because I didn't allow it to perpetuate. But if you allow it to perpetuate, I'm no longer friends with that person because it was like, they didn't allow me my space. They didn't respect me enough to allow me my space. And had they done that, maybe the next day we would have come back together and been like, hey, it got really heated last night. Like, you know, you'd been drinking, yada, yada, yada. Let's just, you know, say our piece and then that's it. And we could have continued, but it was like, no, that was a fracture in the friendship. And it was like, there was no coming back from that. So I'm a full on walk away (laughs) person. I want to, I want to talk about this from a little bit of a different light because I think um Reno and Callan just touched on it from interpersonal and I think that's really important and then there's a part of me that's like okay sometimes we have things thrown at us like triggers 
that it's there's not really an opportunity to work through it interpersonally it becomes our problem so i want to navigate how i work through this stuff on my own and it's like conflict transformation within how can we use conflict or triggers to transform us within when there's heightened emotional activity around it and i think there's two streams i'm going to put my coach hat on here for a minute and talk about these two kind of streams so we have the the mastery of mind and we have the befriendment of body I think those are two complete different experiences and one impedes the other. So if we don't have mastery of mind, then mind is running rampant like a wild animal. We can't befriend the body because when we have, when our ego has been triggered by, by something or somebody, we have a high rumination, right? We, 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 we keep playing out the tape over and over and over again. And we can't get out of the head and into the body where the, where the energy of the experience can move. And I think, um, I'm going to just share some tangible things that work for me in these areas. And I think um, looking at mastery of mind, one of the, the biggest things for me and one of the, the things that's changed my life the most bar none, it would be a practice called one pointed concentration. And I practice it every, every morning and every night for 16 minutes. And it's basically you use something and you focus on it without your mind wandering and when your mind wanders, you bring it back gently. And it's just a constant tug of war. That's it, it will never end. I've been doing this for years and I still have mind wandering. That's the point of the mind. The mind is meant to wander, right? And our, our, our job with our mind is not to stop it uh, or not to get into a state, it's to, to play with our attention, pull back our attention to what we feel matters. And it basically that happens in, in our body so just being in control of your attention and then once we're in control of our attention we can draw our inner gaze down into our body and have that experience and when it comes to the experience and for so many years i never let myself feel my emotions so i developed this giant massive onion it was just layers and layers of all these emotions i didn't want to ever experience and my healing journey was giving myself permission to feel each feeling as they come up in the moment, but also the old feelings that I never allowed myself to experience. They needed to be honored and released. And that was, that, that's a whole other like podcast episode. We could talk about that. And so I won't go too much into that, but I think looking at strategies of how we can release old repressed emotions and also give ourselves permission to experience the emotions that we need to feel in each given moment. And I'm learning one of the best things you can do in, in the befriend your body category would be movement, move the body because it, it's, it's wanting to, if you think about energy, it's, it's energy motion. It's flowing. What build little dams along our little emotional river and then it's not flowing anymore so we need to keep the, the chi or the energy in our, in our body moving so i had a bit of an inc incident the other night where there was or yeah it was it was not last night but the night before where there was some i had an emotional interaction with somebody and it, it brought up a lot of stuff for me and i it was saturday night i decided okay i'm gonna have an in night so i stayed in and i put on some some good music and i just moved my body for three hours like i didn't even realize that time just flew by and i was moving all of this energy and then i went to bed and woke up in the morning and i just out of nowhere i had this massive cry it was like all this energy just was like given permission to release and um so if you look at the two streams, right, you, you, you have to slow down the mind. You have to find time in your day for stillness for you to be able to access the chamber, which is your emotional body. Um, so those would be probably my two strategies to say work. But if you're not a dancer and you don't like that sort of stuff, it can be anything, anything where you're giving your body permission to um, be present with. Because often how we spend so much of our time in our minds and it's like, you can't solve the problems of emotions in the mind. All you can do is just keep on ruminating about them and thinking about them, right? There's no real, there's no end. It's just a loop. And until you break that loop and get into your body, it's going to just keep perpetuating and causing suffering and misery in our lives, right? I love all the different responses. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. I think that'll be very helpful. My, I think my answer is not nearly as sophisticated as any of those, although I will say I like, I like those. Um, 
<laughs> what I do, so lately I've been having a lot of issues with the emotion of fear. Fear comes up for me specifically as it relates to my business and when I'm doing things like this, this video, for example. Fear comes up as soon as I see that green light on the screen, I tense up and, and then here comes the fear. So for me, what works specifically with, with this emotion that I've been using recently is I, similar to what Matt was saying about the body, is I notice where it shows up for me. And for everyone, it could be a little different, right? So for me, actually, I'll do this right now. It's right now, my heart is beating very fast. And I can almost feel it in my chest and my chest is very heavy. So already by sort of going into my body, I that that helps a little bit because I'm thinking, okay, here is where fear is showing up for me. And that's why I know it is fear, it's not something else. So trying to identify the emotion helps me because then I know what I'm dealing with. And then the other thing I've been doing is trying to understand what fear is here for. And we kind of talked about this, right? So these emotions are here to teach us something, they're here to point us in some kind of direction. So I know, I've done the work to know that my fear is here to try to protect me. My fear is here in this particular moment because it does not want me to humiliate myself on this Zoom call. And so my fear is here like, ah, panic, Michael, like, don't do this. You're gonna, you're gonna humiliate yourself. You're gonna embarrass yourself. So my fear is showing up as a way to protect me. And once I know that, then I can, I sort of have this relationship with it. This sounds strange, but if you've seen the movie Inside Out, I think it was a Pixar movie, Fantastic movie. I highly recommend it. That movie mm -hmm. taught me so much about emotional management. So I have this image of this little fear person in my mind who's like, don't do it. Don't do this. You're going to, you're going to, you know, you're going to embarrass yourself or, or whatever that story is for me. And then I can say, thank you, fear. Thank you for showing up as you do. <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway, or, or thank you for, for coming to the party, but I have this thing that I want to do. I want to create this podcast. I want to do this video. I want to talk to Matt and Callan and Reno. So that for me is sort of how fear has been showing up for me really recently and, and what I do. So thanks guys for sharing your strategies. I feel like mine is a little more <laughs> juvenile. I love yours. No, I love yours. <laughs> it's, so, it's adorable. It's, it's so funny that you say that, Michael, because I feel like every time you share something in my experience, I'm just like, and I, I I hope this comes across as sincere as I intended to, but it's like, it's like sweet, and and it's so like relatable, you know. I feel like sometimes when I'm sharing ideas, I can come at them from like this, I don't know, this like high level, or there's just like a lot there, you know. Um, and I just lo I like I learned something from what you just said. I was like, ooh, that's good, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I learned something from what Matt said because he was talking about you can't solve it in the mind and in my mind I'm thinking well that's exactly what I try to do I try to rationalize my emotions in my mind so I want to try some of these other uh strategies that you guys pointed out yeah. oh yeah girl I can take you through the fear challenge no problem because <laughs> <laughs> it's well I always associate fear with the acronym false evidence appearing real mm. and a lot of fear from from my experience a lot of fear is actually it's just that it's false evidence appearing real and it's stories that i make up in my head that don't actually exist yeah. they're things that i'm i'm future tripping on something that i think could happen or might happen or that might be a possibility and i'm predicting what other people think of me or how i'm portrayed or th from that experience and that's when I need to pull myself back and go, this is false evidence appearing real. I do not know how people react to me. I do not know what they think of me. I don't, I don't know what my perceptions are of me. So all I can do is just be myself, bring what I have to offer to the table. And then whatever they want to think of me, that is on them. That is their decision. So in regards to like doing this video, it's like that little fear in the back of your head. It's like, you don't want to like be portrayed as like silly or something goes wrong or you do something wrong. And in my head, how I combat that is just like, it's not my responsibility to dictate how people perceive me. It's just my responsibility to be myself. And that false evidence appearing real is like, yeah, I deal with that, like how I'm portrayed all the time. We, I think we all do to a level, but there's almost this freedom that comes about of like, okay, well, if I fuck up, I fuck up. Like it is what it is. And it's so funny that quite often in those moments of like, fuck up, it, it, those end up being the biggest moments that people remember. And you're like, oh, it was such a mess. 
But then like later on, hindsight's 2020 and everybody's like, no, that was like the best moment ever. Yes. And people like celebrate those genuine moments. So I'm just like, it's so counterproductive for us to like self-guard ourselves against those moments when we know that those moments quite often lead to the biggest you know breakthroughs are the biggest like things that happen you're like oh my god that was so bad but so great like i can laugh at it now and the good thing not a bad thing it's so wild how the human brain functions <laughs> i um i'm reminded of the incident with my mom recently and i remember we were in the vehicle and uh she's like i just wish we didn't have to do this and i was like you know i said to her but you're missing out on something really beautiful here. I said, because this doesn't happen all the time. And when it does happen, you sort of make it a all the time thing. I'm like, but it doesn't happen all the time. And, and when it does happen, we have these incredible breakthroughs where things that we had not addressed relationally come to the surface and we're able to speak on them and we're able to process the charge around them. And then there's a release that happens. And maybe we don't have to have that conversation or that fight or that disagreement or whatever again, right? Um, it's sort of the bigger and the more charged the experience, the greater the release and the uh, enlightenment. And so I used to sleep um like I suffered from obsessive compulsive disorder and I've, I've overcome it um, through, I would say like exposure, essentially. Uh, there's a lot of these irrational fears that would plague my mind. Like, oh no, I left the element on and the house is going to be burnt down when I come back. Or like, oh, I didn't lock the door or something even as dark as um, I'm in this space alone and someone's going to come into it and kill me in my sleep. Um, when I was in the house alone, I would walk around and I check like behind the shower curtains, under the bed, in the closets, sometimes even in the cupboards, because like someone can make themselves small enough to sort of squeeze in there and wait till I was sleeping. Like, and this all sounds absolutely insane, but in my mind, totally rational. So <laughs> what I would do then is I would go to the kitchen drawer and I would get a knife and I would sleep with it next to my bed, sometimes even under my pillow, okay? I'm going there right now. And it wasn't until one day I was having a conversation with my friend who's also a coach. And he said to me, I was telling him about this. I said, I'm staying in this apartment right now and I'm by myself and I have all these like irrational thoughts and stuff. And I was telling him that I sleep with a knife next to my bed. He said, me too. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, yeah. I've I." He, he knew what I was talking about. I had never heard anyone say me too, because I had never shared this with anyone because in, for some reason I knew that it was crazy and I didn't want to tell anyone about it. And he had just confirmed that maybe I was crazy, but I wasn't crazy alone. And that night I put the knife away and I went to sleep and I woke up in the morning and I didn't die. You know, I didn't check the, cur the behind the shower curtain. I didn't check under the bed. I didn't check the closets. I just went to bed. And my mind went on and on and on about how someone was surely going to come in. And I had forgotten to lock the door and all of these terrible things were going to happen. And they didn't. And to this day, um, those irrational fears still come up for me from time to time. But I don't react to them in the way that I used to, you know. And so... Um, one of the things that you had spoken to earlier, Callum, about exposure, I, I'm finding that there's real empowerment and enlightenment and evolution in um, exposing myself to uh, the things that move me, 
um, whether that's joy, whether that's sadness, whether that's anger, whether that's fear, you know, um, because on the other side of that, I've become uh, liberated as a result. So I just wanted to put that out there because I'm sure there are people out there that can relate in some capacity and like it, it, it does get better. It can get better, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what were you going to say there, Matt? I, uh, I'm just feeling so like much love for Michael. <laughs> and I just had to share it because like, um, you know, well, I have a few things I want to say. And one of them, when you were talking, it, what stood out for me is, is sophistication is subjective. It's so subjective. You know what I mean? What people think is sophisticated is it varies from individual to individual. So um, I would say own your truth. Speak what's alive for you right now, because um, everything that you say has value and it's sophisticated in its own way. Um, and then there's a part of me that so relates to you because, and this is the love I feel for you is that I just feel so like, um, for most of my life, I've been the kind of person that it's like, and I still do this in our, in our podcast where it's like, you guys will be talking and I'll be thinking about, oh, what can I say? And then I will think about this thing I want to say. And then I'm, I start to pick it apart. And before you know it, I don't want to share it anymore because I've picked it apart. And, um, that's why I'm practicing this whole just being alive. What is alive for me right now? And I'm when I'm when you guys are talking, I'm practicing listening to you and being present with your every word. And then when it comes my turn to share, I share from a place inside me that is very real and very alive in this moment. It's not it's not prescribed from a previous moment and I'm drawing it into this have to say something that is better than what I said before, or better than what one of you guys are saying, or, and it's just, it's just alive in the moment for me, you know? Um, so, yeah. And it's a fear of mine. Like I did this authentic relating course and there was 20 of us in this zoom room and it totally brought me back to university. And in university, I would always have these brilliant ideas. And then I would never put my hand up because what I would do is I would think of, okay, I'll say this, the instructor is going to say this, and then I'm going to be left dumbfounded and I won't know what to say next. And I'm going to look stupid and blah, blah, blah. So I would never share in university. You know what? I would always have these brilliant ideas. And then the same fear came up for me in this authentic relating class, but I tried my best to push through it by doing this exact thing, speaking up for what's alive for me right now. And, and if that means that I need to take a moment and I need to breathe, I need to close my eyes, and I need to regather my thoughts, like, so what? Like, that doesn't make me stupid or silly or whatever. Like, people people will take the time that they see that you need to get, arrive to the destination that you're trying to arrive to, whatever that may be. So, yeah, anyway, mm. lots of love for you, Michael. Thank you, man. <laughs> yeah. I love you guys. <laughs> I love you guys, too. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. Are we, I think we're, I think we're at time here. Hey, 11, 11. Yeah. Okay, cool. So <laughs> for everybody out there listening, this has been another amazing episode of Gay Men Going Deeper for you. If you want to follow us, please make sure you subscribe to either Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you're listening. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and little bell because then that way you'll get reminded when we release these every two weeks. Also, if you have not joined the private Facebook group, we have that in the links. If you're in the podcast, it'll be in the show notes. And if not, it'll be in the um, links below the YouTube video. Come join us, hang out. And every other Thursday, we release another episode. And then alternating Thursdays, we have a group Zoom that we invite everybody to where we discuss the topic we had previously discussed the week before. So I think that's it. Um, thank you guys for joining on another episode. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.